More people are hungry today than ever before, and the UN warns the numbers are growing rapidly. Billions of dollars are needed to prevent a global food crisis, but what's causing it? And can we do something before it's too late? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. The UN's latest report on global hunger shows we're moving backwards. At least 828 million people went hungry one way or another on a daily basis last year. War, natural disasters and rising temperatures are threatening food security. The prices of wheat and other crops have increased exponentially and will continue to do so. In the Horn of Africa, a severe drought is exacerbating the situation. So let's take a look at the key findings in that UN report. Nearly 830 million people around the world went hungry in 2021. That's up nearly 50 million the year before and 150 million more than 2019. The gender gap has also widened. Nearly 32% of women are moderately or severely food insecure in 2021, compared to more than 27% of men. And around 45 million children younger than five suffer from wasting, which is the deadliest form of malnutrition and increases a child's risk of death by up to 12 times. Haru Matasa visited Kenya's Waja County to give us some insight into how communities are coping. Security officers make it clear. Anyone trying to jump the queue won't be helped. People here are waiting for cash payouts from Kenya's government money to help them cope with rising food prices and a recurring drought. How much they receive depends on how vulnerable their families are. All my animals have died because of the drought. I have nothing left at home to eat. According to the UN, millions of people in East Africa are facing food shortages. The drought stretches far beyond Kenya. Parts of Ethiopia and Somalia have also been affected. Even if it starts raining significantly and people plant crops, it'll be months before they can harvest anything. Climate change is expected to increase the frequency and severity of droughts. As rivers run dry, people like Bishar Borale are traveling increasingly long distances in search of water. I have been walking for days with my animals. I finally found some water this side, but it's not enough. The government has suspended import duties and levies on maize, as well as animal feed, to cushion Kenyans from the rising cost of living. But many are still desperate. It is very hard uh, to say uh, mothers or families might, uh, might run out of food or out of meals for almost a day or two days. Uh, or a situation where uh, sometimes it's even reported a death case due to uh, hunger. It has already been reported. So the situation is very bad. Community elders are worried. They say people have started fighting over dwindling resources. My son was looking after the camels. Four months ago, some men shot and killed him. Then they stole all the animals. For people in northern Kenya, savings are held in livestock. A man without animals cannot provide. Drought can wipe out a family's fortunes and it can take years to recover. So making sure their herds stay alive is a priority. Harumatasa, Al Jazeera, Wajia County, Kenya. Let's bring in my guests for this edition of Inside Story. In Amsterdam, Nils Malema, a policy advisor on climate justice for Action Aid in the Netherlands. And in the French city of Nice is Abdul Reza Abassian, a food market analyst and former senior economist at the Food and Agriculture Organization. A very warm welcome to you gentlemen uh, on this edition of Inside Story. Nils, can I just begin with you in Amsterdam? I mean, we see reports and press releases about food poverty and food hunger all the time. What's so different about this report coming out at this particular moment in time? I think the simple answer is that there's an increase that's just astronomical. We've seen that uh, countries haven't been able to recover from COVID and then conflicts have come along and we're also starting to see the genuine impacts of climate on the food systems. It's exposing just how vulnerable the, the global food systems are to 
uh, to these shocks to the system that we uh, simply aren't able to remedy with, with our current food system. Uh, Abdulreza Abbasian in Nice. I mean, what do you think can come out of this particular report and this, and this press conference for it? Because some eminent names are actually on the list uh, in terms of the presentations. You've got the Director General of the FAO, an organisation that you were connected with. Uh, we've got the President of IFAD. We've got UNICEF, the World Food Programme, the WHO. Um, it's a who's who really trying to uh, get the world to focus on the real problem well, it's very unfortunate, isn't it? Because it's been uh, many years that international organizations led by FAO and other organizations, particularly dealing with, uh, with food, but food systems are warning that we are not really doing what we're supposed to be doing to reduce hunger and malnutrition. And in fact, uh, one thing about this report, which makes it even more sad, is that the numbers, the statistics refers to predates the, the war with Ukraine and all the problems that started this year. It really reflects back on the developments uh, in 2021 and before, and already we had failed. And in fact, prices of food, as you know, had been rising even before the war. So we are in a situation which I think uh, there is no other better term than to call it a crisis. And it's not just in the food sector, as our colleague just mentioned, on the climate side, political side. So really, we are in trouble. And I think uh, it, it, is, it is not, I mean, it, it's good that they all came together and uh, they're pledging again for, for a global effort. Uh, but honestly, um, something fundamental has to happen or else we are into a much, much deeper problems in the future. And of course, you've touched on one of those big issues of, is Ukraine. And Nils, let me come back to you. Of course, we can't blame everything on what's happened really in the recent sort of Russia war on Ukraine. Uh, but we were coming out of a pandemic. We saw the problems, you might say, within two years. But the last sort of 10 years has not been an easy time globally in terms of the way the climate has also impacted on all of this. That's entirely correct. Um, we've seen that droughts have increased. We've seen extreme weather increases. We've seen uh, numerous forms of climate catastrophe happen across the globe, uh, mostly in the global south, mostly impacting women. Um, and as a result, what we've also seen is that local food uh, markets, local food uh, production has been just heavily, heavily hit. And when you bring in the Ukraine crisis, we've seen how the lack of grain, the way we use our produce, the fact that much of it is produced for biofuels, the fact that much of it is produced uh, purely for animal feed, that we're not, um, it, it's, it's just exposing the vulnerabilities of it. The fact that one war can break out in Eastern Europe and have ripple effects all across Africa, all across the global South, is simply shocking when we've also, for the last 10 years, been investing in development and other, um, other processes However, the way we're doing that has made countries uh, like Kenya, countries in the Horn of Africa, extremely dependent on, uh, on, on the global north, which has just essentially meant that they aren't able to produce for their own markets. Local food prices in these countries have been on the rise for a long time because much of the fertile ground is being used to produce non-food agricultural products that are then being shipped out of the country mm. um, and leaving very limited space for local food production. Indeed, I mean, you know, this is that's sort of the, the subject of right here and now. Uh, Abdul Reza, can I just talk about sort of one of the issues in the report that's been highlighted? And, and there seems to be this dramatic jump in figures after 2015. Um, and one wonders what the driving force was, because it says that uh, after remaining relatively unchanged in 2015, the proportion of people affected by hunger jumped in 2020 and continued to rise in 2021 to 9.8% of the world population compared to 8% in 2019 and 9.3% in 2020. Lots of figures here. But what was the driving force? What happened in 2015 that, that, that made it jump so quickly? Because we didn't have the Ukraine war going on and we didn't have a pandemic. You know, we had the, um, uh, a serious crisis uh, with, with food prices back in 2008 to 2012, 13 period. Um, the, to some extent, at that at that time, uh, there were a lot of issues, a lot of, in a lot of countries and so forth. But we never really came out of that problem, and um, we probably contained it uh, through safety nets, through trade, 
um, and also agriculture, which responded to, to the demand and production increases. But in effect, um, uh, the, the famine, the hunger and crisis, a lot of hotspots, geopolitical issues, we're all there. They really didn't disappear. And I think uh, what happened is that uh, after we, we kind of finished with, the, uh, with th that crisis period, uh, we started and uh, you start collecting statistics and numbers and you see, oh, wow, things are really terrible still. And in fact, one could say today we probably never recovered. And from 2015 onwards, we see uh, accumulation of hunger and all the problems that we saw, we have multiple crop failures in many parts of the world happening in also the last seven, eight years. And then you had, we have now almost three years of COVID. Uh, again, you would not have been able to see the implications of COVID exactly when it was happening. It's just afterwards that the statistics tells us what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew, we knew that it would be a disaster. We knew that many countries would not be able to cope with it, uh, but uh, you know, and the warnings were made, and today we unfortunately realize that uh, the predictions were correct. And as it is now, that uh, you know, many many analysts are, are warning about the future being much worse than was uh, assumed before, uh, simply because this war and all the uh, disruptions in trade. Uh, this is not something probably today, again, we, we, we get a feel of it because of the price uh, response and so forth, but it's more than prices. People's consumption is at stake. They, they cannot afford it. They will be eating less. They will be eating poorer food. And, and all of these things is going to come and hunt us back perhaps in, you know, in a year or two. Sure. It's not going, unfortunately, Let's, away. If we can just look at it in more detail then with Nils, because, you know, we're talking about, again, uh, from this press release, 927 million people, 11.7% of the global population, face food insecurity at, at insecure levels. So we talk about the pandemic, we talk about people staying at home, we talk about production not being up to its maximum uh, potential. Are we now talking about scaling up production uh, to pre-pandemic levels? Because there is the problem, isn't it? The workforce, Nils, is not there. And add to that the problems with the climate. So we'll talk about climate in a moment, but let's talk about workforce because you need people to, to pick the food or to uh, collect it from the fields. And that's the big issue for many countries. I think for, for many countries, I'm, I'm sure that is one of the issues. But I think fundamentally, we when we look at the food system, we've made it heavily industrialized. We produce significantly more and use significantly more land than that we actually need to to be able to feed the world's population. It's the structure that we've built this on. It's the way we use food. It's the fact that we're using it for biofuels. It's the fact that we're wasting a great deal of this production, which, and and it's it's easy to fall into figures and markets and that kind of thing. I, I, I want to bring it back also to, to the humanitarian side of things where it, you see families that are able, that would theoretically be able to produce their own food, not able to because they don't have access to land. We see families now pulling kids out of schools to try to make make enough money to afford these uh, these new increased prices, which are just astronomical. So it's not as simple as saying we need to in increase production to match this uh, to, to pre-pandemic levels. It's about readjusting the system in such a way that it is sustainable and that it actually works. Okay, let me just bring in here uh, in Nairobi uh, uh, another guest that is joining us on Inside Story. Uh, Morris Oyango is the regional head of disaster risk management at Plan International. Uh, Mr. Oyango, good to have you with us from Nairobi. Uh, obviously, Africa is always a Africa is always a focal point when we start talking about food insecurity or uh, and the and the and the reasons for it, be it drought or conflict. How is the problem being exacerbated these last few years to the position that you see right now? Um, it has it has been it has really really uh, gotten worse um, uh, because what we are witnessing across uh, the continent is uh, uh, four consecutive failures in terms of rain. Uh, so we are, we are seeing a situation where uh, pastoral conditions cannot re rejuvenate very quickly. In the past, the drought cycles used to be uh, every ten years or so. But what we are witnessing increasingly is uh, drought uh, conditions of uh, every two years, sometimes even every, every one year. And, and all these is being exacerbated by um, uh, drivers like uh, uh, climate change, 
Uh, we, are, we are seeing cases even of food insecurity driven by conflict. So uh, it's really gotten worse in the, in the last few years. You're very close to one of those conflict areas. We saw um, the issue of Tigray being uh, a, a high news story uh, these last 12 months uh, in Ethiopia. Um, we've seen in food insecurity in those areas and in that within, within that part of the Horn of Africa. Uh, how much of a problem is conflict continuing to be? We see it in Somalia, we see it in Sudan, uh, issues in the Sahel region uh, are all contributing to people having to move to migrate to find food and it's becoming more and more difficult for national sovereign governments to actually cater for that migration of people. Yeah, well, conflict is, uh, is, is a major driver, but uh, uh, we, we should not forget the, the fact that uh, uh, climate, uh, climate change is also a, a significant barrier. And this, all these are interlinked because um, in, uh, I'll give you the example in pastoralist conditions where the, pasture, the more pasture strains, the more rain becomes scarce, uh, conflicts around that also get, in, uh, get, get higher. So you, you, are, you are seeing a situation where people are, are, are fighting over scarce uh, pasture, scarce water conditions, because communities move from one area where there is no, no water into an area where they, they think there is more water. And that causes a lot of conflict mm. in some of these communities because of scarcity uh, in, in, in those areas. And uh, that tells you that uh, it's not just conflict. The driver is something bigger. The driver is 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 climate induced. Uh, is, is climate induced? The drivers are, are, okay. are things to do with climate change. So it's something bigger. And we can focus on that now uh, with Abdul Reza uh, in Nice, because in recent weeks we've seen eastern India and northern Bangladesh. Um, have a deluge of rain, the environment is being blamed or climate change is being blamed. But it actually uh, is an example of how quickly people's lives change within a matter of days and how it lasts. As we're still seeing now, there are areas flooded, paddy fields uh, inundated, and it's going to take years, decades to get that into a, a recoverable position. Yeah, and you see, the, the issue is that climate change and all these erratic weather situations that we are facing is a serious problem. And, and we know that. It's evident, and I think it's not strange for anybody. But one thing that we must also concentrate and, and think about is it's not all about food supply. It's about livelihood and it's about, you know, people's being able to actually purchase food. Uh, and that is the other problem that we haven't been able to resolve. Uh, people's purchasing power is diminishing. They're getting poorer, therefore they eat less. And this also has to be addressed. And in fact, one of the drivers, going back to your earlier question, why hunger was rising from 2015, wasn't so much that food wasn't available or supplies were, were trimmed, they were not. And in fact, even today, production has reached pre-COVID level for some of the major cereals. It probably on, on a per capita level, because population also increases, you would have expected, let's say, perhaps produce more, or as our colleague just mentioned, use less for industrial use like ethanol or animal feed and divert it to food. Yeah, all of those things are possibility. But honestly, that is not the big problem today and perhaps the next few years. The big problem is people cannot afford it. Even at the lower prices than they are now, they wouldn't be able to afford it, let alone what prices we have today, which is 30, 40 percent at the international level higher and probably at local level, something like twice as high as last year. So if they couldn't afford to buy the food last year at those prices, how would you expect them to buy this year or next year at current prices? This is a lot to do also with purchasing power as it does with supply. So, Nils, let me bring you in here because purchasing power is a really big issue across Europe at the moment and, and, and for many uh, uh, people's purses and wallets as they go to the supermarket, because obviously, you know, various food is manufactured and it ends up in a supermarket or not. We're seeing a rise in food banks in places like the United Kingdom, uh, across the US, across, you might say, developed urban Western um, countries. Uh, so you have the food crisis, obviously, in, in places like Africa and South Asia, where it's produced in the fields, sold at local markets. And then you have in the other extreme, you might say, in the developed countries, where it's just not available on the supermarket shelf. And people are now resorting to food banks. I think if you if we're very honest about this, we've seen inequality rise globally for the last decades. We've seen 
uh, even in the middle of the COVID pandemic, when generally a great deal of people had their purchasing power hit enormously, their incomes disappear, their livelihoods disappear. Um, and yet the super rich got even richer. And we honestly have a crisis on our hands in terms of distributing and redistributing those funds. We've in Europe and in, in the Netherlands uh, in particular, we've chosen to start taxing labor significantly more than we chat than we tax production or than we've taxed businesses or uh, went so we need to reevaluate where and how we're distributing our wealth um, which I think is fundamental to, to being able to access this food at the same time we know that by shifting over to agroecological practices we know that by uh, including society into this food system that re-establishing a relationship with nature society and and farmers, mm. We can build a system, and we we've seen that system work in certain places where we've worked with it as as Action Aid. Um, it increases all of those things. Those things need to be included in that system. They can't be treated as separate. Uh, issues. Okay, and let me just bring in then uh, Morris Uyanga then in Nairobi, because in the not too distant future, in a, in a few days time, we're seeing the G20 gather in Indonesia. What sort of noises would you like to see from the, you might say, the, the, the leaders of the economic world in terms of trying to deal with the issues that you're facing on your continent? Yeah, th thank you very much. In fact, uh, several points here. Um, one, well, if I just take you back, we are seeing a significant uh, erosion, especially in terms of girls uh, going to school. As Plan International, we are seeing a lot of protection concerns for children. And one of the key messages that I can also mention here is investments in resilient livelihoods, investments, because climate change is going to be with us for a long time. We need to invest in climate adaptation program. We need to support communities to, to ensure that they can have um, resilient livelihoods because the cycles of drought, as I've mentioned, the cycles of flooding, they are becoming more intense and more severe. So if we don't invest in this, uh, it, it, it's going to be really quite catastrophic. And just to, to on, on another point, as we are, as Plan International, we are seeing a lot of hunger across the, the African continent. We are seeing a lot of hunger uh, across, even in places like Haiti. Yeah. We have just launched a red alert as mm. an organization. So the people are dying as we are speaking. So there is also an important need in terms of humanitarian assistance now. Uh, Abdul Reza Abbasian in Nice, I, mean, I know that Nils, you're agreeing with all of that, but obviously the, the, the decision makers will be in Indonesia. They will be talking in Bali. What, what would you like to hear them say? Because you've been at these sorts of meetings on the periphery. You know how they act. You know how they behave. You know what they're thinking. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is that, uh, you know, in my previous job as a secretary of the Agriculture Market Information System, which is the G20 initiative, uh, I'm really, really urging all the G20 members to sit around the table and have a real sincere discussion about food systems and leave politics out of it. This was the purpose of Amos, market transparency and dialogue, policy dialogue. No other time than today, we need that dialogue to really be serious. And I think that uh, people, politicians, Russia is a member, EU is a member, they're all G20 countries. They really have to leave. The war is a terrible thing and there has to be a solution for it, but there is also the food issue. And the food issue, other colleagues mentioned, a lot of the discussions we had today is about long-term, it's an investment in agriculture. That is absolutely true. But honestly, today we have an emergency. And this emergency, at least for today, for the next few weeks and, and months, is something that can be can be easily, easily sorted out mm -hmm. as long as politicians agree to sit around the table and talk sincerely with one another about that issue and leave other things out of it. I really hope that Amos and G20 in particular would be able to put this on his agenda and, and just try to achieve it. Because honestly, if they don't, this will discredit not only G20, but Amos, which you know was for so long a, a, a pride of, of G20. So this is really, really important time. And I hope also that they make sure there are no export restrictions by any country, at least those are members of the G20, so that uh, you know, we, we at least don't add to the already very difficult situations that the world is facing.
Well, we shall see what happens, certainly, at the G20 in, in the days ahead. Uh, for the moment, I'm afraid we've got to end it there for this edition of Inside Story. I'm sure we will revisit uh, this subject in the not-too-distant future. For the moment, uh, Nils Malema in Amsterdam, Morris Oyango in Nairobi and Abdul Reza Abyssian in Nice. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me on this edition of the programme. And thank you for watching as well. You can uh, watch the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. Uh, for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash... AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and the Inside Story team here in Doha, thank you for your time and your company.